Shalom. Today we're continuing in the Gospel according to John. We want to understand the Hebraic background, what the people of his time would have understood about what he was talking about. We're carrying on in chapter 8. Yeshua went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Yeshua stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So there are scriptures in Torah about death penalty for adultery. Leviticus 20.10 And the man that commits adultery with another man's wife, even he that commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Deuteronomy 22.22 If a man be found lying with a woman married to a husband, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shall you put away the evil from Israel. So right up front, they have gotten two things wrong. First of all, there is no stoning required, just the death penalty. And where is the man in this case? They just bring the woman. Both of them should appear. Now, as far as his writing in the dust, it might call to mind the parameters for the test of jealousy. Numbers 5, 17. And the priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel, and of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle, the priest shall take and put it in the water. And the priest shall set the woman before Jehovah, and uncover the woman's head, and put the offering memorial in her hands, which is the jealousy offering. And the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that causes the curse. The bitter water is the water that's made from the dust of the floor of the tabernacle, and the water that's in the cup. And the priest shall charge her by an oath, and say unto the woman, If no man has lain with you, and if you have not gone aside to uncleanness with another instead of your husband, be free from this bitter water that causes the curse. But if you have gone aside to another instead of your husband, and if you are defiled, and some man has lain with you beside your husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing. And the priest shall say unto the woman, Yehovah make you a curse and an oath among your people, when Yehovah makes your thigh to rot and your belly to swell. And this water that causes the curse shall go into your bowels to make your belly to swell and your thigh to rot. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. There is also this verse in Jeremiah 17, 13. O Yehovah, the hope of Israel, all that forsake you shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken Yehovah, the fountain of living waters. And so, in a way, perhaps he is bringing to the attention of the accusers that they have fallen away. Continuing in verse 7, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last. And Yeshua was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Yeshua had lifted himself up, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those your accusers? Has no man condemned you? She said, No man, Lord. And Yeshua said unto her, Neither do I condemn you go and sin no more. So presumably the eldest, having the most experience and ways of the world, are the smartest and pick up what's going on. So they leave first. Eventually everybody leaves. It is Torah that the witnesses should cast the first stone. Deuteronomy 17.7 7. The hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people. So you shall put the evil away from among you. Now there is no requirement in Torah for stoning for this offense. There are four methods of death in the Talmud, stoning, burning, beheading, and strangulation. It is also written in the Talmud that if no specific method is specified, the judge might be lenient. And this is what Yeshua does. He is lenient towards her. Continuing in verse 12, Then spoke Yeshua again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, 
but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, You bear record of yourself. Your record is not true. Yeshua answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true, for I know whence I came and whither I go. But you cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. You judge after the flesh. I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, for I am the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am the one that bears witness of myself, and the Father that sent me bears witness of me. So you already know about the requirement for two witnesses. We are in this season where Yeshua talks a great deal about being the light of the world. Remember in the previous chapter we talked about tabernacles and how tabernacles had this exhibition of light, of menorahs in the court and it being so light in Jerusalem. And Yeshua comes in the midst of that and says, I am the light. We're going to be moving from Tabernacles two months ahead to Hanukkah, which we will see in John 2. And it says in 2 Maccabees 10 that the reason that Hanukkah was celebrated eight days was because they were actually celebrating Sukkot. And they celebrated the festival to the Lord for eight days, like the festival of Sukkot. And they remembered the previous days when they celebrated of the festival of Sukkot in the mountains and in the caves. And they went out in the desolation, the wilderness, like wild beasts. So we're in this season where there's a focus on light. There are many, many scriptures which describe God as being light. Daniel 2.22, he reveals the deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. Isaiah 42.6, I, Yehovah, have called you in righteousness, speaking of the servant, and will hold your hand and will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. Continuing in verse 19, Then said they unto him, Where is your father? Yeshua answered, You neither know me nor my father. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. These words spoke Yeshua in the treasury, as he taught in the temple. And no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Then said Yeshua again unto them, I go my way, and you shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, you cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he says, Whither I go, you cannot come. And he said unto them, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I said before unto you, that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. So again we see his time has not yet come. One of the central themes, people are always looking at the flesh, as he said before. They don't understand the spiritual things. Clearly, he's not going to kill himself. This is abhorrent to Torah. It is abhorrent to all the teachings. We establish life. We love life. Continuing in verse 25, Then said they unto him, Who are you? There is this continuing confusion about who he is. And Yeshua said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spoke to them of the Father. Then said Yeshua unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spoke these words, many believed on him. Then said Yeshua to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. How do you say you shall be made free? Yeshua answered them, Amen, Amen, I say unto you, whoever commits sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. These people have had a huge brain cloud. Really, they were never in bondage? What, they forgot about the seminal event that formed the people? that form the Israelite nation, the bondage in Egypt. Now, a slave does not stay forever in the house. Just as Satan, if if he tempts you to follow him, he will use you until you are used up, and then he will spit you out, and you will not be in his house. Continuing in verse 37, 
I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Yeshua said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We are not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. So the works of Abraham are established in Genesis, that he believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. These people are not able to understand, and they don't believe God. Furthermore, they're taking a slap at what was spread abroad about Yeshua's illegitimate birth. It's documented in the Talmud that he was the son of a promiscuous relationship with a Roman soldier named Pandira and Mary Magdalene, who was supposedly married to Papas ben Yehuda. So this is mentioned a few places in the Talmud about Ben Pandira, and it even says his mother was Miriam, who braided women's hair. So they are defending themselves. We are not illegitimate. They are accusing him, you are illegitimate, because they don't understand who he is. Continuing in verse 42, Yeshua said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God, hear God's words. You therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. So the concept of original sin and having a sinful nature is not part of traditional Jewish theology. What they believe is that you have a good inclination and a bad inclination. Almost that typical picture of the little angel, the good angel on one shoulder and the bad angel, the bad devil on the other shoulder, talking to you at the same time. And it is up to you, out of your own self-will and out of your love for God, to do what's right. So this is very offensive to them when he calls them sons of the devil. It's just not something that's in their theological framework. Continuing in verse 48. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that you are a Samaritan and have a devil? Mm -hmm. See, only the Samaritans can have the devil. Jews don't have devils. They have a good inclination and a bad inclination. Yeshua answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeks and judges. Amen, amen, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that you have a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And you say, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? Yeshua answered them, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honors me of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said unto him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? Yeshua said unto them, Amen, amen, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to cast at him, but Yeshua hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So this statement of his, when he says, I am, goes back to Exodus 3.14, where Moses asks, Who shall I say is sending me? And God gives him the name, Ehye Asher Ehye, which really translates into, I will be whatever I will be. There's no way to actually say, I am, in Hebrew. That verb form doesn't exist. This is the only place where Ehye is used as God's name. Going forward, we're going to see the name Yehovah, and even going backward, the name is Yehovah. These two words both come from the same root of the root of to be, but the Ehye 
the one that says I am is in the first person. The Yehovah is basically in the third person. Now, when we look at this in the Septuagint, we can see that the I am that's translated from the Ehye in Greek is Ero Ime, I am. And when Yeshua is speaking to these people in this last verse, he uses the same formula, Ero Ime. He is equating himself to God. This is considered blasphemy, and this is why the people are wanting to stone him. Leviticus 24, 15 and 16. And you shall speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curses his God shall bear his sin, and he that blasphemes the name of Jehovah, he shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall certainly stone him, as well as a stranger, as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemes the name of Jehovah, shall be put to death, specifically by stoning. Now, it's quite interesting that there was a pile of stones sitting right there. From the Maccabees, the temple had been defiled and there had been a pig sacrificed on the altar. So after the victory, when they consulted what to do with the altar of burnt offerings, which was profaned, they thought it best to pull it down, lest it should be a reproach to them because the heathen had defiled it. Wherefore they pulled it down and laid up the stones in the mountain of the temple in a convenient place until there should come a prophet to show what should be done with them. They don't want to just throw them away because at one point they were holy, but then they were defiled, so they couldn't make a decision. So they're waiting for the Messiah to come and tell them what to do. And these are the stones they pick up to stone him. But he walks through the crowd. An interesting chapter. It starts with stoning and it ends with stoning. Until next time, keep your eye on the sky. Your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.